Welcome to the Whale Scout Podcast, everyone. My name is Whitney Negebauer. Today is October 12th, 2021, and we have something a little bit different today. We are going to be talking about beluga whales because, as many of our listeners know, there is a wayward beluga whale in Central and South Puget Sound, and it has sparked a ton of interest in beluga whales. And so we have joining us today a biologist from Alaska, and she is working to help recover the beluga populations up in Alaska. And she's also the acting marine mammal strandings coordinator with NOAA Fisheries. So Barbara Mahoney, thank you for joining us and welcome. Well, thanks so much for having uh, having me attend your um podcast. Well, yeah, like I said, everyone is just so interested now in belugas. Our listeners are, you know, arguably a lot more into killer whales, orcas. Um, But now we have this just bizarre sighting in Puget Sound. And it has been recited a number of times by whale watching boats and private boaters. So um, we are now very hungry to learn about belugas. And we're also rather concerned too about this individual. Um, can you tell me when you heard about this wayward beluga and what your initial reaction was? We heard um, actually from um, Facebook and from Kristen Wilkinson, your uh, training coordinator in Washington, about this whale uh, being observed by boaters in and around the Seattle area. And and we, you know, you kind of get skeptical, but of course in the video was right on that it was a white beluga, an adult beluga swimming in your waters. Yes, it was very, very striking because it is so beautifully white. Um, And it was funny listening to the conversation of the the people on the boat. They were thinking minky, you know, they were kind of going down the list of probable marine mammals to see in our area. And then, hey, beluga. Um, It was very, very, very uh, strange. Um, are you concerned about the health and the well-being of this animal? Well, from the photos that were taken, and we've had our expert veterinarians look at that, and those that are familiar in, with belugas here in Alaska and study them, um, they say that it looks thin, but it's not emaciated. Um, so, you know, we are monitoring it through the pictures shared by the people there in Washington to check about its health. But right now it seems to be doing okay. And any idea if this is a male or a female? How would we know on a beluga? It's very difficult from the dorsal the dorsal side, the back side, to identify male and female. But um, if for some reason it rolls over, you could tell from genital slits if it's a male or a female on the ventral side, on the belly side. But yeah, we haven't um, working with um, people that are you know that know belugas. It's very difficult to talk about uh, to identify the whales from the dorsal side. They don't have a prominent dorsal fin. They don't have a a sexual dimorphism by male or female because of characteristics on their body. So it'll be, right now it's unknown if it's a male or a female. Okay, and so tell us a little bit more about where belugas are normally found and how um, their populations are identified. And I understand that there's sort of a special population called the Cook Inlet belugas. Can you tell us a little bit more about those guys? Sure, sure. Um, Belugas are generally in the Arctic and subarctic waters. So the southernmost for Alaska is the Cook Inlet population here in in and around Anchorage. Um, And it's an endangered population. It was listed as endangered in 2008. It's a NOAA species in the spotlight. So we're giving a little bit more attention to this because we do think with um, additional information and research and understanding of the population, it could help recover that population to its natural um, to its normal abundance of, of over a thousand animals. And right now it's under 300. Um, it is the closest population being the southern part of Alaska to Washington state. So it's possible it could be a cooking at Beluga. It's possible it could be another beluga from the Bering Sea populations. Um, but through photo ID and, and hopefully some genetic material that was collected from the water near the whale, we'll be able to mark it, be able to identify it. Okay, so we, you said a couple things there that really grabbed my interest. The first, that the belugas are photo identified, is that correct? Yeah, we have um, um, helped fund a program in um, Cook Inlet since 2005 that has taken photographs of belugas annually to identify them. We have over 300 
Belugas identified from the left side and another th over 300 identified on the right side and 80 identified on both left and right. And as you know from your killer whales, there's, you know, the markings of the dorsal with the saddle patches, you're able to identify killer whales well through markings of these white whales and, of course, fantastic photographies, fantastic pictures, we're able to um, identify individual beluga whales. Wow, that is amazing. You know, just looking at the, um, there was a helicopter that um, spotted the whale and looking at the photography from above, it almost, you know, you could see some very slight markings, but from an untrained eye, it just looked pure white. So that's really impressive. It, it, it seemed impossible at first. I was here when they were first proposing it, and they were doing some similar studies, of course, in St. Lawrence estuary population of belugas, and and they gave it a try here, and it proved to be successful. Um, yes, and you're right, though, there's different, you know, lighting requirements or, you know, and definitely good photography, good pictures and with a good camera to be able to get that close up shots to show the subtle uh, markings. Some are less subtle, but a lot of them are like you mentioned, they seem to be indistinct until you have an expert. And, and Tamara McGinnis and Amber Stevens are two of our experts here in Alaska. Wonderful. And then you said something else. You said that there was a sample collected. Can you share a little bit more about that? Sure, sure. Um, we're able to, working with the Northwest Fisheries Science Center Lab and Kim Parsons, able to collect um, um, water. And from that water, you collect some environmental DNA material. And the hope is that from that um, sample, water sample, that they'll be able to extract some DNA from this particular whale. And that's from maybe slopping skin or, you know, for some feces discharge and such. Wow, that's incredible. So does that mean yeah, that amazing. like older methods where you would have to collect like a skin or blubber, blubber sample are basically obsolete now with this eDNA work? It, everything's going to add or you can get a little bit more from, of course, an exact biopsy or taking like the skin with a little bit of blood. But you're going to be able to extract a lot more information on the animal, the age, the health, the sex, of course. But with the environmental DNA that they're collecting, it depends on, of course, if it's an adequate sample and then what they can extract from that and how viable or um, how useful that how useful that sample will be. Okay, so as of right now, October 12th, this sample is in the hands of um, of a lab somewhere in the Seattle area. Yeah. And when might we expect to hear results back about, uh, about they who They were this thinking about a week, week to 10 days, so we might get some good information. Again, if that's if they got enough of the sample, um, you know, in if they collected enough of the sample to be tested. So it's unknown at this time. Same with the pictures. We've got a lot of pictures. Some were... Uh, more distant than than what can be helpful to us, but like you mentioned, there's that um, helicopter um, uh, video that was shared with NOAA and NIMS. So we're going to be able to move in and zoom in on some of those pictures of the whale and see if we can get some drone footage of the markings that you mentioned, as well as some of the pictures that were taken from people out on the boats. And NOAA was out on the boat um, a couple of days ago, and they got some good pictures too. So it's a matter of, you know, seeing m matching them with the information that we have up here in Alaska. Okay, so all of this is being done to try to understand who this whale is and where he yeah. or she may have come from. Is that right? Yes. And, then, and that'll help us understand, you know, what, where this whale is from and what it might be doing in your neck of the woods. Okay, and so once we can hopefully understand who or, you know, he or she is, would there be any um, need to intervene or try to relocate the animal? You know, what might come next? Well, we're definitely going to continue monitoring it and working with the public in your areas and uh, working with our lab with the, you know, uh, well, Alaska is actually helping the Washington Stranding Network. So Kristen's kind of working with the, the public there in Washington about documenting and monitoring where this will is. And we understand it's moved, you know, north of um, Seattle into Whidbey, near Whidbey Island. So that's getting outside the, your, your strait there. So that'll be good if the whale makes it all the way back to the Pacific Ocean and kind of heads north. Um, but definitely, you know, the eyes and ears of people in your communities will help us identify where it is and and, and the days that um, people are seeing it. And we can track it that way. But right now, we're, we're besides monitoring, 
we're not going to have any intervention in terms of capturing this animal. Um, if it does somehow live strand, then we'll be doing an assessment of the animal at that time. Okay. And has this ever happened before to a beluga? Because my understanding is that they're fairly social, like our, our orcas here, and that they live in pods. Have there ever been any other um, lone animals? Well, um, last year you guys had, well, not last year, there was a white beluga found down in San Diego. And um, we have records of belugas on the East Coast from St. Lawrence going as far south as New Jersey and New York. Um, and so we have, it's not common, but it has happened in, in record history. And I guess you guys had one in Washington in 1940. Um, that was observed as a white whale. I don't think there was photo identification, but good good um, explanation of what they observed to identify it as a white beluga. And they're very distinct, as you know, with their coloring. Yes. And is there any indication of why this might happen with a lone animal being separated from its group? You know, not sure, but you're right. Um, belugas and Coquinlet, those that we've studied in Bristol Bay, I mean, they do tend to hang out in, in large groups. Those can be half a dozen to hundreds of the animals. And depending on the size of the population, you know, upwards of thousands if you get up to eastern Canada. Um, but they may be separating in smaller groups for feeding. I'm not sure how this animal, you know, got by himself, and then of course continue to travel in a in a, di a direction that wasn't home. Right. You know, we hear a lot in the news about climate change and how climate change is driving a shift in distribution of animals. Now, typically, we think, you know, of animals moving further north, and now this animal is moving south. It's sort of counterintuitive. But could climate change have any, um, you know, impact in this? Um, I, I don't know because, um, uh, you know, we belugas um, tend to be in the Arctic and subarctic. But, of course, when the Beaufort Sea belugas uh, population and the Chukchi Sea population of belugas up in northern Alaska, when that becomes winter and ice up, they do move south away from the ice. So, you know, they're, they're, um, they do tend to hang out in these ar Arctic areas, but, and they've adapted to the prey availability at that, at those locations. But in terms of why it would move south, I'm not sure. And same with St. Lawrence, you know, with those whales moving south towards the busier harbors of, of New York and New Jersey seems more odd. And this whale is moving towards Seattle with your busy harbors. It seems that it would be more, to me, I would think it would avoid that area, but, but it went to your backyard. Certainly. And, you know, we have some other visitors in our backyard that are um, a little bit concerning to people. These, of course, are the transient or the mammal eating killer whales. And yeah. they have been observed um, in Puget Sound at the same time as this beluga. Is there any concern that there might be a negative interaction there? Well, we do know that killer whales prey on belugas and, of course, the gray whales and the humpback whales. And they've been documenting now preying on the bowhead whales up north as the killer whales expand. The transient killer whales, the marine mammal eating killer whales have expanded the area north. So they um, have been known to uh, prey on cooking the belugas and they've been witnessed to prey on cooking the belugas and weird found carcasses. So, you know, for sure, if, if they were to interact, it, could be detrimental for this white beluga. Well, th thank you so much. Is there anything else that you really want the public to know about this animal and how they can help? Um, I think it's been fantastic, the public response and the interest about, about belugas in your area, and then learning a little bit about our endangered population up here in Alaska. Um, I do appreciate, or I don't I mean, just me, but Noah appreciates, you know, all of the responses and, and the information that's been shared uh, with the Stranding Network, with Orca Network, and maybe with your program here about where the whale is and when it's at that. And due to the public um, reports, you know, we were able to get real-time 
um, information and send a boat out where the whale was currently. And that's how we were able to get some good pictures and how we were able to get some water samples and observe the animal, as well as, of course, the shared um, video from one of your news channels. So, um, yeah, it's been fantastic and a great collaborative effort. And the more that's in, shared with NOAA, the more we'll be able to monitor and hopefully understand how this whale is doing and keep it up while it's still close to shore. And hopefully it'll keep moving north and 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 come back home if, if Alaska, you know, back to where it lives in Alaska. Yes, and if people want to learn more about the um, species in the spotlight, the Cook Inlet belugas, um, can they uh, go to a specific website with NOAA? Oh, yeah, they can just type in NOAA and Cook Inlet belugas, and that'll link you right to our page. It's, it's been updated by our training coordinator, uh, Jill Seymour, and it has some good information, and it'll keep you updated about what's happening in Cook Inlet. The research that we're doing is pretty extensive getting additional information from only biopsies, but acoustics has been a lot of work done in Cook Inlet for acoustics to better understand why this population has not recovered to, you know, to, you know, to above 300 and hopefully back to its normal numbers, abundance of over a thousand, but we're working towards that. Wonderful. And that just, you know, sparks something else. Could acoustics be used to identify this animal? Do they have a unique um, acoustic um, collection of calls? They, 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 you know, um, good question in terms of, you know, belugas are well known to be canaries of the sea with a lot of a large repertoire of noises and they make a lot of calls um, and they particularly in the, you know, as I mentioned before, as I mentioned, um, the darker waters of Cook Inlet, there is always echolocating and um, and calling and talking, communicating with each other. Um, but um, I'm not sure that we're there. They, you know, they don't have a signature call. Uh, has has not been separated and identified. And that means we'd have to do more acoustic recordings in other populations. But we're getting a better understanding of the calls here in Cook Inlet and, of course, their, their acoustic range of, of um, what noises they can hear. Well, thank you so much, Barbara. That is fascinating, and I can't wait to go learn more about belugas. I, I really appreciate you taking the time today, and all of our best wishes go out to you and your team and everyone working on the water trying to do the best that they can for this animal. Yeah, and, and again, Noah, thanks to you know, the, uh, the citizens and communities on the coast of Washington to you know, help us better follow and track this animal and, and get good pictures shared by the public with us as well. So that's been fantastic, a good collaborative effort to, you know, monitor this animal and hopefully see it go back home. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for listening today. For more of these podcast episodes, head up to www.whalescout.org. There will be a full listing of all of our podcasts. If you have not watched our episodes on YouTube, head over to YouTube, just search Whale Scout, and you can like and subscribe this podcast to see more. And as always... Um, when we're watching marine wildlife out um, in Puget Sound and anywhere in the world, it's important to be respectful, particularly of this animal, this beluga that um, has gone off course. And so if you happen to see this animal, it is important to report the, your, your sightings to the proper authorities. You can report it to um, 1-360-331-3543 which is the Orca Network um, sightings hotline. And you can also report it to the West Coast Marine Mammal Stranding Network. And their number is 1-866-767-6144. And I will put both of those numbers up on our website as well. Thank you all so much for listening.